let us make a constitution for all the people, one we will be proud of, and our children will receive with delight. And then what happened? Well, Tillman and the rest voted to disenfranchise the Negro anyway. How did this happen? How did we come to this? After the war, we was moving forward. At the 1868 Constitutional Convention, we ratified the most progressive constitution in the country. Blacks and whites had equal voices. Now it seems, 27 years later, we've lost that voice. And once again, our freedom. 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 I love that word. That's all I ever wanted. Freedom. Freedom for you, my sweet girl. Freedom for my wife. Freedom for everybody of any color and any background. We the people. All of us. We all have the right to freedom. But President Lincoln asked me, why did I sacrifice my life and the life of my family? on that warm spring night, May 12, 1862. And you know what my answer was? Freedom. That night. And oh, what a night it was. I was thinking of my mama. She was on a plantation in Beefield. And that night, I was thinking of her as I was staring the planter through that harbor. My mama, your grandma, what a woman. You see, I was what some would say a privileged slave, if there ever was such a thing. The McKee family took to me, and I didn't have to work in the fields. But you know what my mama did? Your grandmama? And she told Master to take me down to the field so I could see how the Negro worked. And it was hot. I mean, the sun just beating down on their back, never looking up, just working, sweating and working. I recall this one man just stopping, as if just to pause to take a breath. And then the man in charge yelling at him to get back to work. Well, he heaved one more breath before he got back down to picking. But I guess it must have been one breath too many because they took him to the whipping post. The whipping post. They beat that man for taking a breath. A breath. Well, that moment changed everything for me because I knew right then and there that those white men, the McKee family, no matter how kindly they treated me, that to them, my breath belonged to them. I was their property. So you know what I did? I started getting in trouble. And some might say, good trouble. But mama said it was bad trouble. I was breaking rules. I even spent a little time in jail. That's when my mama sent me down to the harbor. Start working on them boats. On the planner. Beautiful ship. I learned everything I could about that ship and that harbor. You see, that's the interesting thing about some white men. They think the color of our skin makes us dumb. Now what kind of thinking is that? How can my skin stop me from learning, from thinking, from discovering? I mean, your skin can't stop you from thinking, now can it? So I just learned everything I could. I started working on the planner a month before the war. And I was there on the harbor when the South fired on Fort Sumter. People standing up on their roofs, cheering on the Confederate soldiers, and me just standing there, looking, looking, Wondering and thinking. About a year and two months later, my chance came. You see, the planner was being loaded with supplies and scheduled to ship out the next day. 
but I had other plans. That night, and oh, what a night it was, May 12th, I took the wheel of that ship, I took the wheel of the planner, 3.30 a.m., 16 men, including myself, including your mama, your sister, and you. Well, I had to take you with me. I couldn't leave you all behind. But I was scared. Scared down to my bones. I had taken the captain's uniform and his wide straw hat. That hat. I pulled it down just so. So nobody could recognize my face. You see, we had to get past Fort Johnson and Fort Sumter before the dawn came up. Before anyone noticed. So we passed Fort Johnson. And my blood was racing. But I knew the whistle codes. Too long. And one short. And then Fort Sumter. By then, the sun had come up, just enough so we could see the Confederate soldiers, and just enough light so they could see that my skin wasn't white. But I pulled that hat down, and flipped up my collar, and I knew the codes. Too long, one short, and they let us pass. No one noticed that I didn't turn left, and I headed straight towards the Union blockade. The Confederate flags were still raised, so I had to time it just right. Too soon, and the Confederacy would fire on us. Too late, and the Union soldiers would fire on us. And it worked. And you should have seen the look on them Union soldiers' faces when we emerged. Sixteen slaves, smiling, laughing, dancing, rejoicing in our freedom. <laughs> and what a gift we had for them soldiers. You see, the planter had six cannons on it, some of them Union cannons, a thousand pounds of ammunition, and plans, Confederate Army plans. I had done it. I had got my family to freedom. But I knew it wasn't free yet. I had to do more. So I sent you, your mama, and your sister back home to Buford, and I became a sailor in the Federal Navy. Not official, of course. I mean, my skin was still black after all. My commander called me a pleasant-looking darky. But I did enjoy using all the information I collected from the Confederacy against them. Union troops, planes, supplies, and codes. <laughs> and then I kept on fighting. I fought in 17 battles. I earned a rank and a pension from the Federal Army. And I was there. I was there on the planner when the Charleston surrendered. Pulled her right up into Confederacy headquarters. And then I went home. Home to Buford. Home to where my mama was enslaved as a person. To where I was born an enslaved person. And I bought that plantation. But I knew the fighting wasn't over. And if Tillman and his men are any indication, the fighting won't be over for a very long time. Oh, my sweet baby girl. We got to make them see us. A constitution for all the people. All the people.